Okay, folks, just to sort of explain a little bit about what I did. In, t in uh, 2002, I realized that my passion for going around ruins of all sorts intersected with several academic things that I was interested in. And I thought, right, from, for the next three years, I'm going to study industrial ruins. And so with that in mind, I got a small amount of money uh, from the ESRC, a funding, government funding body, and I set off for the next three years on various voyages around the UK, my car, got a little bit of money for petrol and cheap accommodation. And uh, I kind of really drove the length and breadth of, of the UK looking for industrial ruins, a whole series of foundries, mills, um, workshops. Often it wasn't very clear to me what these industrial ruins have been used for, but they were quite easy to find in most places. There were certain epicentres of ruins, you kind of might uh, guess what they are, were South Wales, the West Midlands, Tyneside, um, parts of Scotland as, uh, as well, central Scotland. And I had a kind of ball going around all these ruins. I must have visited something like 200 or so. Uh, I never had any problems accessing these sites, uh, neither did I get into any trouble whatsoever. Uh, and in doing this research, I also took lots of photographs, and these photographs will come up. There's about 30 images that are going to come up uh, over the course of the talk. Okay, so this resulted, as Hayden mentioned already, in a book, uh, several academic articles, but also two websites that, are, that are, are still in existence. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is the way, one of the ways in which I understand ruins, or I, particularly industrial ruins, which were the things that I limited myself to. And for me, ruins are a site at which and from which to critique contemporary kinds of urban space. More specifically, I guess, my view is that urban space is becoming a little bit overpredictable, a little bit too regulated, a little bit too smooth, a little bit unsurprising. Now, that, I don't want to make this as a, as a sort of totalising argument. Everywhere isn't the same, but I think these are kind of broad tendencies. And so what I want to talk about just very briefly are, are four areas that ruins talk back to. That in particularly in terms of cities and the way they are now. So the ways in which cities regulate the kinds of practices we can do. The ways in which cities regulate the sensations we feel. The ways, ways in which cities... Um, in many cities, there's a kind of aesthetic regulation through design and also the ways in which cities regulate the past, what commonly called the heritage industry, I guess. Uh, and so I'll just start off by, I think, talking about practice. Now, it's kind of fairly obvious, and we, most of us have visited St Peter's today, and we can see that because there's no surveillance at this site, all sorts of things have happened. There's all sorts of traces there. So ruins are kind of important places uh, because they're away, they're sites usually away from kinds of policing. As I've said, getting in is easy. There might be signs on the outside that trespassers will be prosecuted and that guard dogs are there, very rarely. Um, so you can live there if you want, if you're homeless, you can find it as a, a you can find different spaces within a ruin uh, to temporarily live. If you're a heroin user, you can use it as a shooting gallery. In many of the rooms that I went round, I came across people shooting up. It seemed to me a good space in the sense that these people were away from being bothered by the public. <clears throat> Likewise, the public were not sort of uh, upset by the sights of people injecting heroin. As we've seen today, uh, ruins are a site for graffiti, but also, also all sorts of other kind of artistic interventions. They're also a site for all sorts of fun. Um, parties, uh, many rooms were used for raves in the kind of early uh, years of sort of rave culture. They're places where people go to drink and, and take drugs. But they're also sites of pleasure for kids, uh, dens uh, and play spaces, I guess, or alternative kinds of playgrounds, we might say. The sites for action sports, you can see people kind of climbing and uh, mountain biking through ruins. Also more maybe what we might call rational recreational forms, gardening, and again we saw that today, uh, and the reclamation of materials. People can build sheds and walls out of the stuff that they can loot from ruins. And of course there are also places for confronting nature in the city. Uh, nature often tried, kept at bay. You go into ruins and you know, I came across all sorts of wildlife during my, my uh, journeys. 
butterflies, bats, foxes, and all sorts of plants and fungi. And of course, they're also used for film sets. And I know this uh, St. Peter's is used as a, a student uh, film sets and for advertising shooting as well. So there's a way in which some ruins are becoming increasingly commercialised. So they're a kind of place for all sorts of practices to take place that are often frowned upon in the city. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about is the way in which cities increasingly regulate, maybe hinder to an extent, the certain kinds of sensations that we confront in the city. Now, just to get into many ruins, you have to manoeuvre your body in interesting ways. You might have to climb or stoop or even kind of get your belly on the ground and creep under a, a, a fence. So straight away, your body is enlivened and experiences a kind of different uh, use uh, the, to the usual walking in a straight line that might take place in, in, in cities. We get dirty in ruins as well. Maybe an unfamiliar sensation as an adult. And smells suddenly confront you, smells that we're not used to uh, sensing in a deodorised city or a city in which kind of commercial uh, scents are produced. But uh, in many ways, smell has been kind of regulated in interesting ways in cities. There are all sorts of sounds in there, extraordinary sounds. There can be, a, we can confront a, a level of quiet we're unused to. And within that quiet, we can start to hear all sorts of unusual little creaks and sounds and animal noises and rustlings and drippings and so forth. So we kind of tune ourselves to a different kind of soundscape. There are all sorts of textures that we can confront, things we can pick up, we can play with them, and if we want, we can smash them. And nothing's really that precious uh, in, in many ruins. And I, the way that I like to think about this, people call it vandalism. I kind of rather like to think of it as a more radical engagement with materiality. So if you go into most ruins, you will see things are smashed up. Why are they smashed up? Because smashing things has a certain pleasure to it. Um, we can't usually do that, but we can, we can see the spectacular ways in which things fracture and smash and collapse. So bodies then, to a certain extent, are enlivened by being in a ruin in a way that they usually aren't in what we could argue, in, in certainly many cases, I think, are kind of smoothed over cities where walkways, uh, uh, you know, smooth linear paths uh, guide our bodies through rather unstimulating space. Aesthetics. Um, what's interesting about ruins is that nothing is assigned to place anymore. Things fall out of the places that they're supposed to be. Uh, and in addition to that, decay produces a kind of emergent aesthetics. This is an aesthetics that's continuously emerging. It's not something that's arrested or fixed for all time. It continuously changes. Things evolve, come into being. So objects and different kinds of materialities get jumbled up to form all sorts of weird mixtures and strange compounds. Um, and moreover, in the kind of industrial spaces I was going in, uh, into, there were all sorts of un unidentifiable things, objects. I didn't know what they were. They were kind of curious. Um, and of course, we're not used to that. We're used to seeing things that are kind of labelled in commodities in shops, shop windows, for instance, everything in its place. And to come across a whole series of things that we can't recognise, or can't identify, is kind of quite maybe disturbing, but also kind of quite exciting. So these might be things or, or, or residues uh, from industrial processes, objects and stuff that we're kind of not familiar with. Um, <clears throat> things look kind of sculptural. As the function of an object becomes irrelevant in a factory, in its industrial function, it is, its form is foregrounded. And very often, you know, as things kind of move around or shift or fall into different places, the form of that thing becomes foregrounded. And you suddenly realise that these utilitarian objects can look quite beautiful in the right kind of contexts. <clears throat> Weird juxtapositions also occur. Things come together and then strike up these kind of odd relationships with each other. Again, in the city, that's kind of often hard to see because of this endless coding of place, the way in which the city becomes kind of over-designed, managed, and often, you know, aesthetically coded so uh, certain things are kept out of place. I mean, the kind of most obvious thing is you can't paint a door purple in your streets most of the time. But in ruins, all sorts of things kind of emerge and are set, all sorts of kind of our aesthetic uh, appreciation of the, of, of the city can be transformed. The final thing that I want to talk about is memory and the way in which 
ruins, the industrial ruins that I was talking about, challenge the potted accounts and fixed forms and privileged stories of what we might call heritage. Heritage accounts, you go on a guided tour, or you go around a particular site, and there are information boards that guide your interpretation of the place. And by guiding that interpretation of the place, they also restrict your scope for interpreting that place otherwise. That's the thing that I want to emphasise. So in ruins, there are lots of signs of previous workers, for instance, their clothes, the tools, machines, the places they sat, and the kinds of vernacular art and fun that they had. So there's all sorts of kind of graffiti and scrawlings and, and jokes that you'll, you'll find in, in these industrial sites. So plenty of evidence of the people, but the people, of course, aren't there. And they can't tell you what it was like to work there. And so above all, when you walk through a, an industrial ruin, you have to use imagination. You have to use conjecture and fantasy to capture the past. You have to engage with the past in a different way. Nobody's telling you what that past was like, but there are all sorts of clues around you, available to pick up and interpret as you will. And <clears throat> what the emphasis that I would kind of, the, the word that I would kind of use here is that you can kind of feel the past. You can sense the past, but you can't narrate it. At least you can't narrate it very articulately. You can have a go, you can stab, have a stab at it, you can kind of compose particular kinds of accounts if you like. But it, this is a, a kind of a different kind of, uh, a different kind of narrative to those potted and official accounts that I'm talking about. Moreover, in ruins, the patina of space exists. And as I've already said, it's kind of emergent. The textures, the colors of space uh, emerge. But there's also kind of, in, as I've said, industrial residues, you can tell that the place is an industrial site because the bricks uh, or the stonework is kind of covered in, in sort of smoky residues and so forth. Heritage sites, what happens? That gets cleansed. And so the kind of patina of space, again, this kind of feel of industrial space is hard to apprehend when everything's polished and everything's swept away and there's no muck around. Uh, and so there's a kind of way in which you can inhabit the bodies of the people who work there, not literally, but you can gain a sense of what that industrial space uh, felt like to walk amongst the kind of debris, to walk on these kind of hard functional floors. Um, and again, it's kind of hard to find words and it's difficult, but that doesn't matter. You know, you have to improvise and make up stories is, is, is how I like to think about it. Now, this is not really an attack on kind of heritage per se, but the, what I want to kind of foreground is that ruins offer a site for composing alternative accounts and an alternative confrontation with the past. OK, now just to conclude, um, when I was, I said this to a couple of people today, when I was writing my stuff on ruins, in 2002 to, to about 2004. I was a bit embarrassed about the topic. I thought it was a, not a very scholarly thing to be looking at and that people would scoff at me and laugh and they wouldn't take me seriously. But I couldn't, nothing could have been further from the truth. And then as soon as the book came out in 2005, I was kind of asked to speak all over the place. But more importantly, there was an absolute deluge of writing on ruins. And not only academic writings on ruins, but kind of popular writing on ruins, popular activities, urban exploration, and also a whole host of artistic engagements with ruins. And if you kind of go on the internet now and you look up sort of photographs of industrial ruins, well, you, you, you know, you'll be, you'll be preoccupied for many months. There is a kind of a ruin mania at the moment, and it's kind of interesting. And I don't know whether this kind of event, at least the kind of interest of this kind of event has, has uh, produced, would have been possible let's say 10 years ago i don't know and there's something about now that is creating a, a, a sense that we want to engage with ruins and i think it's got something to do with some of the things that i've talked about that our relationships with other kinds of space we feel kind of as though we're missing something and, and ruins maybe answer some of those uh, issues now but I've, having said all this and having talked about why I think my, uh, the, my industrial ruins provide a countersite to, to the organised uh, 
city. After going round St Peter's Seminary today, I have a completely different take on what should be done with this particular space. And that is, for the, the seminary itself at least, not necessarily the wall gardens or other sites, but I want to see it entirely removed of any clutter and for that structure to stand firm and to be kind of visible. So it, it's kind of odd really, although I can, don't want to go back on any of the things that I've said, it makes me feel quite odd saying this today when I feel that my response to the seminary is for that structure to be highlighted and therefore that would necessitate the removal of all the kind of clutter that I've just celebrated. So I'll stop there. Ahem. <clears throat>